Yo, I'm Bob. Into Marvel. Happen to be totally blind since birth. Talking about X-Men, the animated series. Season 3, episodes 5 and 6. They are the Phoenix Saga parts 3 and 4. Cry of the Banshee and the Star Jammers. They are the 31st and 32nd episodes of the show. This is take number 6 bajillion, by the way, because of all the numbers that correspond to the Phoenix Saga episodes. Holy moly. So, yeah, parts 3 and 4 would air on, um, let's see, September 7th of 1994 and September 8th of 1994. So I had to wait a week in between parts two and three to find out what was going to happen. And it must have been really awesome for those of you who got to see this thing when it premiered all week long. You had to wait a day right after Juggernaut breaks into Xavier's quarters to uh, kidnap Alandra. And we get that really fun fight scene at the beginning of the episode. It is short, very, very short. But uh, I like seeing Lalandra wielding her CR weapon uh, just before Xavier is, I think, attacked from behind by Tom Cassidy, Sean Cassidy, or Banshee's brother. It's a really cool introduction to the character, and I wish we could have seen more of Black Tom in X-Men the Animated Series. I do remember they made an action figure of this guy at one point in the Toy Biz era, but um, I think I was really into Star Wars at the time, so I passed up Black Tom uh, in favor of probably an X-Wing that made noise or a, a TIE fighter with solar panels that blew off of its side. So poor Tom, he got passed up by Kid Bob. I am sorry, Tom. <laughs> you would have been cool to add to the, to the collection. At least I think Tom was a Toy Biz action figure. I'm relatively sure he was. We got a really fun fight scene there at the beginning of the episode. I kind of wish it had been just a little longer. Uh, and then you got Kane nearly ending Xavier, but then Banshee saves him. I love that scene where Sean uh, screams for the first time. When I was introduced to ACDC uh, by my dad's ACDC Live album at the end of the 90s, it was released in 1992, uh, Brian Johnson was singing all of the songs by that point. I couldn't help but think of Banshee from X-Men the Animated Series. I... I get serious ACDC vibes from Sean screaming in uh, the Phoenix Saga part part three here. So, yeah, reminded of ACDC quite a bit. I don't know why. I think it might be the, the range that the voice actor can go to for that really insane banshee scream here uh, as he's flying to, to grab Charles. So you've got all the X-Men thinking Charles has gone nuts at first. He admitted himself in the last episode that, yeah, I got to go to Muir Island. Um, I can't be trusted. I'm beginning to doubt my own mind after his dark side attacked the entire team. So, I mean, that's where he is. Wolverine, at first, is the only one who's like, guys, maybe we need to look into this. And Cyclops immediately says, yeah, you know, we've seen more strange things than Moira McTaggart can imagine. So they're all off to Muir Island. And this is the first episode in which we see Rogue all season, I think. She's been going on a very long mission. I always wondered what she was up to uh, in the previous episodes. But awesome that she's back for the remainder of the Phoenix Saga. Um, so we get to see Cassidy Keep and Eric the Red. I like how he shows back up right away. Lalandra identifies his real name. Shikari was well, his full name is Devon Shikari. But uh, for some reason, he doesn't want to go by that name. I, I, maybe it's because people might start calling him Sheki or something. I mean, who'd want to go by Shikari if your your buddies are going to jokingly start calling you Sheki? I, I don't know if he will or won't. But he's a spy, and I get why he's going by Eric the Red. It's a cool code name. But yeah, he's not really much of a of a warrior. I like that he's kind of a little weasel. Uh, he kind of gets the the space station zombies to do his work here. Um, he tries firing at a Juggernaut and Black Tom, and Juggernaut, you know, he's immediately attempting to crush this guy's head by the sound of things. You've got the other X Men. They. They finally find where Xavier is. I like that this whole episode takes place in uh, in Scotland, by the way. I think Muir Island is one of my favorite locations in X-Men. 
I like how Wolverine, he's uh, sniffing the air and he identifies Juggernaut uh, and then the two other individuals that were there. And right away, Moira McTaggart's like, oh, so Charles isn't nuts. Okay. Uh, I mean, it does make sense. Maybe she's met Wolverine before. She knows what his keen senses of smell can really do. Uh, I just thought that was funny that uh, she immediately accepts uh, what Wolverine can detect with his uh, with his nose. But maybe there are some some blaster burns that that have shown up on the walls or something. I don't know since this show doesn't have any uh, audio description tracks. But yeah, they had the Cassidy keep. Now there's a freaking helicopter flying over uh, my house like a phoenix. I gotta pause this again. I really wish we could have seen more of Sean and Tom in the animated series. I like that imagery of a stag fighting a dragon. And of course, that's how Xavier's able to, to pinpoint where they are. Well, it's actually Banshee who is able to do that because right away he knows that his brother has taken the Landra to Cassidy Keep. And so I love the, the big brawl in the castle. The entirety of the second act is just fighting, fighting, and more fighting. Pity that there is no uh, synopses out there of who's doing what. I mean, you've got Eric with his space station zombies. You've got Jubilee trying to go up against the Juggernaut. Uh, you have uh, Gladiator, who's a member of the Praetorian Guard, the leader of the Ken's Praetorian Guard, showing up. And he just throws the Juggernaut out to sea like he's nothing. That was one of my favorite scenes. I love how a Jubilee is like, I didn't think anybody could do that to Juggernaut. And, you know, Jean, all through this episode, she's um, not doing too much. I think she's attempting to learn her new power. She's actually recovering from what had happened in the previous uh, episode after she got back from space. And when she knows, when she learns that Lalandra's in danger, she just zips over to Muir Island and then I think she flips Gladiator away like he's nothing. So you've got um, Juggernaut being wrecked by Gladiator, then Phoenix wrecks Gladiator. Um, Black Tom and Banshee, they've been wailing on each other with their fists because their powers cancel each other out. I like that scene because when Cyclops meets Havoc later on in a season three episode, that same thing uh, happens again. Uh, one thing I, I don't think I picked up on right away, even though they verbally are kind of confused about it, I think one of them says, hey, what gives? And maybe Cyclops says, yeah, what's going on? But um, I don't think I, I, I caught that right away. But it's another instance in which the powers of siblings kind of cancel each other out. And uh, yeah, they've got to, I think, resort to their fists here. And yeah, so even though it looks like Lalandra is saved, the Ken shows up and he can feel the crystal's power. And I like how the episode ends with our big bad. He's just kind of standing around laughing. Not much of a cliffhanger. I'm sure that was to the delight of the viewers of this thing the first time around. I mean, even though it, it is a to be continued, uh, they've they've saved Lalandra. So part four, the Star Jammers, is basically the Race Against Time episode. It's all for for naught, of course. Uh, but I like how we're introduced to Corsair, and that he turns out to be Scott's dad. So I think this was the second big what the heck kind of revelation I had in terms of so-and-so is really so-and-so's parent. I'd seen The Empire Strikes Back before I watched part four of the Phoenix Saga, so I think this was only my second big uh, so-and-so, so-and-so's parent revelation that I ever had in uh, TV or movies. So it was a really fun moment for me when, uh, you know, Gene was gleaning that information. I like how as she's using her powers, she is getting stronger and stronger each time. But I think there are little clues here as to um, Phoenix becoming a bit more dominant. I mean, yeah, she is. She's not yet experiencing uh, as many emotions as she will be later on. But you can see here uh, how powerful she's becoming. Uh, for instance, when she flipped gladiator away in the in the previous episode there uh, she's really coming into her own and i like how i mean at least i thought the writers were were setting up uh, just how dominant and just how powerful uh, the the darker persona of the phoenix is going to be uh, when we reach the dark phoenix saga much later 
uh, in this season. But I love the Star Jammers. When Guardians of the Galaxy was announced, uh, I automatically thought of the Star Jammers from X Men the Animated Series uh, whenever the, they were announced in the MCU. Like, I mean, I'd already seen a ragtag group of pilots. I really enjoy the Guardians, but these guys were, um, I think, my introduction to swashbuckling pirates in, uh, in the Marvel Universe in, in the 90s. And I liked uh, Hepzibah. I think she's one of my favorite characters in terms of her appearance. And since she's doing all the vicious cat meows, I think this is back when she was more cat-like. I read much later that you know now her ears kind of look more like a skunk's ears. Maybe her tail is more like a skunk's tail as well. But in the 90s here, especially in the animated series, I think this was when she had a more cat-like appearance. And I had no idea till very, very recently that she and Corsair have a thing in the comics. And I want to say they actually kiss in one of these episodes. It's kind of cool that even though Cyclops' dad lost his wife a long time ago to Deken, that's why he wants to try to take Deken out in this episode for revenge, of course. Uh, he's he's found someone who uh, who he can relate to. And he's got this ragtag crew that that he chums around with i really like christopher summers and wish we could have seen more of this guy we only get to see him in the phoenix saga as well as orphans end and that's it i don't know if he shows up to scott and gene's wedding and beyond good and evil or not i think that uh if he does it's you know silent cameo and he doesn't say anything so scott is very empathetic toward Christopher here, uh, when he finds out that his wife had come to her in by Deken's hand, uh, he decides to take this guy out. Even though it goes against his morals, he feels like you know that they've got to to take Deken out in order to save the galaxy. He cannot be allowed to get his hands on the uh, the Mkron crystal. At least in this incarnation, they pronounce it Mkron. In the Marvel video games. Um, I, I do believe it's pronounced Macron sometimes. So there it kind of reminds me of some kind of cosmic McDonald's sandwich. So of course the, uh, the guy that Scott and Chris were going to take out is, is a shapeshifter. And then you've got that battle at the end of part four with the star jammers versus the Praetorian guard. And Deken is ruthless. I like how he's, um, right away. He's, he's holding his own sister hostage, which is awful but i mean it's just the kind of character that he is uh, and gladiator i like that his loyalties are starting to shift here he's beginning to question what uh, deken is is wanting to do i mean because he is a very honorable man and i like that uh, during part four uh, he's he's not too keen on going against their word uh, when deken uh, told corsair that he would uh, he would keep his word and they were going to give him half the treasure. And he's like, nah, glads I want you to end this guy and his crew. And throughout the entirety of the episode, you've got Gladiator. And I like how his loyalties are, are going to be shifting toward the Landra. And on the Disney Plus version of the episode, I do believe that is Richard Epcar. I think that's how you pronounce his last name. I don't think it's Epker. If you pronounce his last name Epker, you're probably saying it like somebody from Arkansas. I think it's Epcar, but I, I'm not sure. I need to watch some more interviews with him. I tend to watch a lot of uh, interviews with, with these voice actors here. He's one of my favorites. Then I think someone else, uh, they dubbed someone else in for Gladiator. If you've watched some other versions of it, at least I'm pretty sure they have. Uh, I think I've got a different version on Amazon Prime where Gladiator's got a different voice actor. I think I like Richard. Uh, he's, you know, he does Raiden in Mortal Kombat. Uh, he does Joker in Injustice 2. He does Rhino Blaster in Mighty Morphin Power Rangers uh, among a myriad of other monsters and villains. So I liked that he was doing Gladiator here in uh, the Phoenix Saga. One of my favorite characters and I liked how the episode ended. The, the, uh, the bad guy got the crystal, and now the galaxy is going to be pulled in unless the X-Men work together with the Praetorian Guard and the, uh, the Star Jammers. I like how the conclusion is set up. Like, nothing they do managed to get the crystal away from Deken. I like how Phoenix Jean, uh, she is beginning to sense that 
she might have to make the ultimate sacrifice in part five. I think she's starting to feel that as part four begins. And as she teleports everyone away to get the crystal before we go into the big race against time for the Mkron crystal thing. I would give both of these a, uh, a 10 out of 10. It is, it's quite a lot of fun to explore various parts of the galaxy. Uh, you know, we go from Scotland to, to space and then we go back to Earth in part five. Just so much going on in this miniseries. And I really wish we could have seen more of the Star Jammers as well as the Shi'ar. We only get them in a handful of other episodes. Maybe they'll explore more of these characters in X-Men 97. I sure as heck hope that they will if we get more than just uh, one or two seasons. I think we're actually getting two. Hopefully we'll get three. Anyway, that'll do for this video. And I'll hear you guys next time. One last thing, I can't film this video without thinking of Marvel Ultimate Alliance in which we got to see quite a bit of the Shi'ar and uh, what they could do. I had some really awesome friends who played it back in the day. So uh, yeah, just a shout out to them and, and uh, Marvel Ultimate Alliance. Pretty fun game released way back in the, uh, in the early 2000s.